So we're in week three of our series, Baggage, and we've been addressing this tendency in our lives to carry unneeded weight around with us that Christ never meant for us to carry. Now, has anybody traveled by plane recently? Okay, uh, we just recently went to, uh, had to fly to Buffalo, New York and back, and, and if you've traveled by plane recently, you witnessed a new travel game, uh, everybody's playing it these days, it's called how many bags can I sneak on the plane before I have to pay the $25 baggage fee? Like we just try to sneak them on and, and the definition of carry-on has changed. Now it just means if I can carry it and sneak it on, it's a carry-on. And, and so we, people are doing this all the time. There's three factors uh, that play into this. First is the aforementioned $25 luggage fee that nobody wants to pay. The second is the invention of the roller bag, which makes it way easier to sneak giant bags onto the plane. But the third is just our... Uh, what we convince ourselves we can't live without. Now, if you travel a lot, you've learned uh, to travel light, but most of us, when we travel, uh, particularly vacations and things like that, we tend to overpack. How many of you are chronic overpackers? Yeah, a few honest people. How many of you are sitting next to a chronic overpacker? Yeah, lots more hands, lots more hands on that one. So uh, maybe you just found something out about yourself. But, uh, you know, the, and here's the reality. I, I think today we're going to talk about emotional baggage, and I think that we have the same tendency when it comes to our emotions. We tend to be chronic, emotional overpackers. Now, all of us have emotional baggage because all of us have emotions. And emotions aren't bad. They help us enjoy life. Uh, without emotions, there would be no crying, but there would also be no laughing. There'd be no anger, but there'd also be no joy. There'd be no hate, but there'd also be no love. And so emotions in themselves are not bad. The problem is they're incredibly fragile. Uh, emotions are like a mirror. They reflect our perspective on life. And so when we, whatever we face in life, it gets reflected in our feelings. It gets reflected in our emotions. And typically when things hurt us, it not only gets reflected, it gets somewhat distorted. And so let's say that uh, you, you tend to, maybe you had a horrible childhood experience or a fight with someone 20 years ago that's kind of still going on, or maybe you had a relationship went bad, a marriage that failed. Uh, maybe you uh, you lost a job, or you didn't get a job you thought you should get, or maybe uh, somewhere along the line you, you lost a loved one, uh, and, and the emotions of that are, are very real, but we end up a lot of times in that pain and with a broken or distorted view of either God or ourselves or others around us. That's known as emotional baggage, and too often the baggage that we carry comes to us based on, it comes at the hands of people around us. So watch this video, and I think you'll understand what I mean. So fill in the blank. Sticks and stones may break my, but what will never hurt me? Isn't it crazy to you that we say that to our children? We tell them that to try to protect them. The problem is it's not true. See, words have incredible power. Stick and stone injuries heal uh, relatively quickly, but word injuries tend to linger. You can hear a hundred positives and one negative. What do you remember? The one negative, right? And for how long? For a week, for months, for years, right? It just, it becomes this emotional baggage we carry that weighs us down every day. Les Parrott and Neil Clark Warren in their, uh, wrote an article called Exploring Your Emotional Baggage, and this is what they say in that article. History is what's happened in our lives. 
Baggage is how we feel about it. Everyone has in the history and an emotional response to it. What matters when it comes to being a healthy, thriving human being is whether or not you have deliberately unpacked your baggage. If you want to become the person you were meant to be, you've got to unpack your baggage. Think about your life right now. What emotional baggage are you carrying around? What are those negative things in your head that are playing over and over and over and they're destroying your confidence and they're keeping you bound up? Aren't you sick of it? Aren't you ready to kind of just be done with that? Today would be a perfect time for you to unpack your emotional baggage or begin that journey of unpacking it and live lighter and freer than you've been in a long time. So turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 12. If you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 682. If you didn't bring a Bible you'd like to follow along, just raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. Uh, you can use it, return it in the back when you're done. Or if you don't own a Bible, just keep it. It's our gift to you. If you've got your smartphone out and you're looking at version, the Bible app, version, uh, our notes are under, if you go to under the events tab, uh, all of our notes are there as well. But in Romans chapter 12, Paul has just spent the first 11 chapters unpacking the truth of who God is and what he's done for us and how much he loves us. And in chapter 12, he comes to kind of this climactic moment where he says, listen, in light of all that God has done, we're being called to respond with our lives. So Romans chapter 12, page 682, starting with verse 1. He says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, and pleasing and perfect. Now we're going to use that as kind of a, a base point to jump off into some other texts, but today I want to talk to you about three lies that Satan tell us, tells us that leads to emotional baggage and then our typical reactions to them. Lie number one that Satan tells us is you don't fit in. You don't fit in. And our response typically is we choose to conform we choose to try to fit in. This, by the way, was uh, describes pretty much my entire childhood. Uh, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again, first because I think it illustrates well, but also because uh, it's way cheaper than therapy. Um, if I can be honest, when I was a kid, I was awkward. I was gangly. I didn't really you know, fit in. I wasn't one of the popular kids, but I wasn't kind of uh, picked on either or an outcast. I was something I, that felt worse to me. I, I felt invisible. I felt like nobody saw me. So I want to tell you the story of the worst day of my young life, or at least what I thought was at the time. My parents took really good care of us, but when it came to clothes, they were cheap. And now I don't, uh, at least that's what I thought then. Now that I'm the one paying for the clothes, I would call them thrifty. But um, <laughs> at the time, I didn't understand money, you know, I just like, why would they not buy me this stuff? I thought they were cheap. And they would buy me decent clothes, don't get me wrong, but they would never buy me the, like, the name brand stuff. And everybody at school was wearing designer jeans, Okay. Uh, or at least I thought everybody was, you know, and, and, and so uh, one brand I always wanted, one pair of designer jeans I always wanted, uh, was popular in the 90s, was Jabot jeans, okay? $80 a pair, that's insane, okay? But I, I thought that seems completely reasonable to me because I wanted them. Well, one time my mom was feeling particularly bad for me, and I, I think I brought home like a really good report card or something, and she decided to spoil me. She said, we're going to go out, we're going to buy you some of those jeans, and I was like, hallelujah, you know, and so we go to the store, and folks, they were having a sale, so I got a pair of Jabot jeans and a Jabot shirt, set it across the, Jabot across the back. I, man, I was so excited, and that was not the worst day of my life. The next day, I put on my new outfit. Man, I looked good. You know, all the girls wanted me, all the guys wanted to be me, at least that's how I felt, you know. And people were commenting, and they were saying, oh, look at his clothes. And, and they noticed me. For the first time in a long time, they noticed me. All day long, I felt like a rock star, right? And that was not the worst day of my life. The next day I woke up, I was feeling great, I hopped in the shower, and I went to get dressed, and it hit me. Oh no, I only have one pair of Jabot jeans. I only have one Jabot shirt. I wore them yesterday. I have to wear my regular clothes today. That was the worst day of my young life, and I kid you not, I went back to school, and people made fun of me. See, because I thought I wanted to fit in, and I had to conform to do it. Now, that's just a dumb story about jeans, okay? But how many of us do this in our lives where it matters much, much more. Paul tells us in this passage in, in verse 2, he says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If you were to 
pull out the word picture out of this text because it's a very descriptive language, it would be the, the word phrase, don't, you, don't wear a disguise. Don't put on a mask. Don't conform your outward life to just copy the behaviors of the day. Don't act like everybody around you or fashion your life around the world's values. A scriptural example of conformity, in the Old Testament, there was a great conformer. His name was King Saul. Saul was God's chosen and anointed king. He was supposed to be this great leader of his people. Uh, the problem was he, he would give in to people's whims. If you keep your finger in Romans and you flip over to 1 Samuel 15, page 171, uh, you will read the story of King Saul. He was commanded by God through Samuel the prophet to destroy this nation, the Amalekites. God says, wipe them out completely. They're evil. They're, wipe them out. Don't, don't kill all the animals. Don't keep any stuff, any treasures. Just wipe them out. And Saul goes in and he sort of obeys, but he spares the king. And then he listened to his men and he kept a bunch of the stuff, a bunch of the valuables, the animals and the valuables. And God says, I'm going to destroy Saul. I'm going to take his throne because he didn't obey me. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 13 to 15, it says, when Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I've carried out the Lord's command. Then what's all this bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear, Samuel demanded. Well, it's true that the army spared the best of sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but we're going to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God. We've destroyed everything else. And Samuel confronts Saul. And listen to Saul's answer in verse 24. I think this is very important. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I've sinned. I've disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. Watch, for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. Saul was a conformer. Conformers give in to people. They give in to the loudest voice. They conform their wants. They're driven by other people's expectations. Today we would call this peer pressure. The problem is he disobeyed God in the process. Let me ask you a question. Are you more afraid of the people in your life than you are of the giver of life? Which voice is louder in your ears? Which voice drives you? Do you give in when you should stand firm? Do you cut corners? Do you sacrifice God's standard morally, relationally, financially in order to fit in. Uh, maybe you had someone tell you you don't fit in and the rest of your life you've given yourself to trying to conform to what the world wants. The problem is you're doing it at any cost. You know, God expects us to, to save ourselves for marriage and, and yet how many of us, you know, like maybe you've been in a situation where you gave up your virginity because you didn't want to end the relationship. You were afraid the other person would leave you and then they did anyway, you know. Maybe you've got kids and you want them to... to to grow up to stand up for themselves, but all the parents are letting the other kids do all these things and you're feeling the pressure to let them do things that you know they shouldn't do either. Maybe you started, you know, got involved with drugs or drinking or whatever because you just really wanted to fit in and now you're addicted and, and you don't know what to do. Maybe you, uh, you lived a certain way, you've lived at a certain level or bought a certain house or a certain car whatever to try to, you know, fit in with the neighbors, but you're drowning in debt. Maybe that's your struggle. Maybe you're a conformer, and the lie that Satan's telling you is you just don't fit in, so you try to conform and conform. Maybe you're not struggling with that one. Maybe you're struggling with number two. This, this lie Satan tells us is you aren't good enough. You aren't good enough, and so our response is we choose to perform. I'm going to prove that I am. Look at Romans 12, verse 3. Paul says, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Literally, the phrase here is don't be high-minded or don't get a big head about yourself, which may seem opposite of the point, but it's really not because every one of us in here has heard the lie at some point, you don't measure up, you're not good enough, you don't have what it takes. For all of us, probably, that leads to discouragement, but for most people, it leads them to a place of performance where they set out to prove they're actually good enough. I'm not my family. You know, I'm not my past. I'm better than that. And so they try to set out. And when performance becomes your motivator, pride becomes your greatest nemesis. As you try to prove to the world, you're good enough. In the Bible, a great example of this uh, great performer was a woman named Martha. We read about her in Luke chapter 10, page 623. Martha wanted to make an impression on Jesus. He was coming over to her house and everything needed to be just right. And she figured maybe if I perform well enough, he'll accept me. We read in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 40, as Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner 
she was preparing. Or some translations say she was distracted by the preparations. So you got Martha, she's slaving away in the kitchen. She's cleaning the house, trying to make sure everything's perfect. Mary's just sitting, chilling with Jesus. And Martha gets upset and she literally says to Jesus, Jesus, will you tell Mary to come help me? And Jesus says, no, Martha, you're the one who's messed up. She's got it right. But Martha was so driven. Everything's got to be perfect. Everything's got, everything's got, and she, everything in her life was driven by one thought. I hope this is good enough for Jesus. You ever find yourself spiritually driven by that thought? Man, I hope, I hope, that, I hope I'm doing enough. I hope God's happy. I hope this is good enough for Jesus. This idea that we have to be good enough is driven into us from the time we're children. You know, have the best grades, you know, be the best on the team, be first chair in the, in the band, be the first one picked for kickball, you know. And anytime we fall short, it leads us to one of two paths. Either we work harder, become even more driven to be the best, or we just give up and don't try at all. And we see kids on both sides of that spectrum all the time. And by the way, that we don't grow out of this. So many of us are playing the same games. Either we've just given up, we don't care, or we're still performing in everything we do. Got to perform for my boss. I got to try to be the perfect spouse. Got to be the best in all I do. Got to always be getting ahead, always getting the advantage, always, you know, moving ahead, moving ahead. Let me give some examples. Parents who work to be, you know, better provide, want to give ev their kids everything. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with both parents working, but so many, you know, you see them trapped into working long hours to make all this money to provide for their kids when all the kids want is just more of mom and dad. Or are you ever, uh, anybody ever do the, uh, you know, when, when somebody's coming over to your house, the pretend to be perfect thing, where you're like hiding crap under the furniture and, you know, like, quick, they're coming, you know, and, and you ever, but you ever gone over to somebody's house and everything really does seem perfect? It, perfect house, perfect clothes, perfect makeup, car, kids, like everything, it just like seems like this can't be, I, this is crazy. And yet we, we just put on that front. To be honest, you can fall into, we can fall into temptation as a church, because I don't know, you know if you know this, but if. Anymore, if a church isn't what people want or saying things they don't want to hear, what do they do? They just leave, and they just go to another church that will tell them what they want to hear. And there are churches out there that will not stand on God's word. It will tell them what they want to hear. And the temptation for church, even, is to compromise what we stand on in order to make people happy. Perform, perform, perform. Maybe you're a performer. Maybe that's what you struggle with. Or maybe you struggle with the third lie. You're not worthy. You're not worthy. And our response is we choose to cling I think far too many people listen to this voice because somewhere along the line we were rejected, abandoned, abused, maybe our marriage fell apart, our family fell apart, our finances fell apart, and our coping mechanism is we cling. We grab onto something. Let's read Romans 12, 1 to 2 again. And I want you to hear Paul's heart in this. He says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Paul is literally begging here. He's saying, I plead with you. I urge you, in view of what God has done, give yourself to God. It's an act of total surrender. And maybe you've done that once, but you know what the problem with living sacrifices is? They can, they can crawl off the altar. You ever been there in your life? God, I give my life to you. I'm going to live for you. Oh, oh, squirrel, you know. Oh, God, I'm going to give my life to you. And then we get back off the, oh, God, I'm going to give my life to you. Oh, I don't like that. And, and back and forth, on and off and on and off and on and off the altar. And we're, we're on the altar when we want to be, but when it gets tough, we crawl right back off. And the picture here is daily choosing to be a living sacrifice, to give ourselves fully to God. But in order to give ourselves fully to God, we have to let go of whatever it is in our life that we're currently holding on to. See, here's what I think our problem is. Our problem is not that we don't want to give ourselves to God. We do. Our problem is we can't stop clinging to something else. It's not that I don't want to give myself to God. I'm just holding on too tight to other things. In the Bible, a great example of this is the woman at the well in John chapter 4, page 639. Jesus is in Samaria. He comes across this woman. She's drawing water from a well in the heat of the day, which tells us a lot about this woman. See, most people would come in the morning or in the evening when it was cooler, but she's out when nobody else would be there in the heat of the day, which means she's either avoiding people or they're avoiding her or a combination of both. And as the story goes on, you find out it's because of her reputation. In John chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, Jesus says, go and get your husband. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke to the truth. 
And he points out that she's a clinger. You see, a clinger is someone who looks for their meaning in something or someone that they attach themselves to. They look for their meaning in the things around them. This woman is trying to find her meaning in relationships. And this is what clingers do. They look for validation in all the wrong places, in people, in status, in stuff. The rich young ruler is a great example of a clinger. Jesus said, come and follow me. Give, give away all that you have and follow me. And it says he went away sad because he what? He had a lot of stuff. He was clinging to that stuff. Maybe you're a clinger. Maybe in your life, you've heard in some form, you're not worthy, you're not worthy of love, you're not worthy of acceptance, and this little voice in your head keeps telling you that lie and telling you you're not worthy, and so what's happened is then you hold on tight to the first thing that comes across your path, the first thing that you stumble across that gives you any sense of worth, the only problem, it's not Jesus. And it doesn't matter what that thing is, eventually the thing that makes you have that sense of worth will at some point make you feel worthless but you don't know how to let go and just find your worth in Christ alone. The reality is that all three of these things create baggage in life, and it's where far too many people are, living with regret, hurt, shame, fear, guilt, bitterness, anger, just weighing us down, emotionally weighing us down. And when the call of Christ is to live in freedom, but we just have no idea, how do I get rid of these bags? How do I let go? The only way to release lies is with the truth. So let me end by telling you three truths about who you are in Christ, and maybe this is the part that you need to hear. Number one, in Christ you're forgiven. In Christ you're forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life, the old baggage, all that stuff is gone. A new life has begun. I have people say to me all the time, I know God can forgive me, but I can't forgive myself. People say that all the time. I think they think they're being humble. Really, it's a form of spiritual pride. I, I know that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, can forgive me. He has it within himself to forgive me, but I, I'm too good. I can't forgive myself. Like, that doesn't make sense. Well, what God is really saying is, why don't you just be humble enough to accept the grace that's been given you? In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds, and not just barely free either, abundantly free. If you put your faith in Christ, you are forgiven. Number two, in Christ, you're secure. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 to 22, it's God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He's commissioned us and he's identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he's promised. How many of you uh, Pearl Jam fans? Yeah, a handful that are willing to admit that in church. Um, I, in high school, I was a huge Pearl Jam fan. Like I was part of the Pearl Jam fan club. I paid money to be part of this fan club. And I got to, you know, you get these cool LP records that they didn't release anywhere else. And then on top of that, uh, you would also get uh, a list when the tour dates came out, and you got to, to kind of like apply for tickets before anybody else. I got to see Pearl Jam in Minneapolis in the sixth row, and Eddie Vedder looked at me. Yeah, it was awesome, okay? <laughs> and the coolest part was there were a whole bunch of people at that concert who didn't get to sit in the sixth row. And the way they stopped you were those, there were those dudes, you know who I'm talking about, with the black security shirts and no neck, and like their arms are like my legs, you know, these guys? But I could go right up to those guys. I had nothing to fear. You know why? I had a ticket. Just show them the ticket. Listen, in, Jesus Christ is your ticket to a free life. It's your ticket to a free life. In Hebrew 4, 14 to 16, it says this. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We, we don't have a priest who's out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. I love this. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Maybe that's what you need to hear today. Would you just take the mercy and accept the help? Which will lead you to number three. In Christ, you're free. John 8, 36 says, so if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Or in the message, paraphrase, if the sun sets you free, you are free through and through. Think about your spiritual life. Think about your soul right now. Is your soul in Christ free all the way through? 
Is it free through and through? Is anybody caught up? You've got some hurt, something in your past, some baggage, some emotional stuff that, that you just need to let go of in order to be all God made you to be? Maybe today would be a great day to unpack that bag. To stop conforming, stop performing, stop clinging, and just let go. I'm going to ask that you bow your head with me. And uh, first and foremost, i got to believe in a room this size, there are people in this room who just, you've never accepted Jesus. You've never started that journey. You don't understand that God loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you to set you free. All you got to do is believe in him, put your faith in him, and Jesus will pay your price. And you can be free. You can experience eternal life with God. Maybe you're saying, I need that. I need to, I need to walk with Jesus. Is there anybody who would raise their hand and say, I, need, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior today? Yeah, several around the room. You can put your hands down. If you did that, I want to challenge you to take your weekly handout and, and just there's a box in there that says, Today I accepted Christ as my Savior. I want you to check that so we can walk with you and follow up with you. But I'm going to pray a prayer. And I just want you to pray this in your heart. I'll pray it out loud. I want you to pray this in your heart. And, and this prayer starts you on a journey of following Christ. Maybe you're a believer in the room and you just need to reaffirm this as I pray it. And it goes like this Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I admit that I'm not right with you. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I believe with my heart, and now I'm confessing with my mouth, Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And I put my faith in him today. Amen. Now, here's a challenge we're going to end with. If you were here last week, uh, we did a challenge to give people an opportunity to come and get on their faces before God at the altar. And we had these suitcases around the front of the room, a four across the front of the room, uh, just giving people an opportunity to, to come up here and to write something down and just let it go, an addiction or, a, or baggage in your life or unforgiveness, whatever it is, a person's name. Maybe, you know, I just needed salvation, whatever it is, uh, and to be able to, to let it go and to kind of symbolically let that baggage go in their life. And, and maybe there are some of you who were here last week and you didn't do that. You're like, man, I wish I would have. I wish I would have got up. I wish I would have gone up there. Uh, we're going to give you another chance today to come up during the song and just there's pieces of paper up here. To just it, Maybe it's just one word you write that symbolically kind of, summarizes what you struggle with and, and, and just the power of, of putting it in there in the suitcase, letting it go, giving it to God and then the important part, turning around and walking away and begin, beginning to live in the freedom that comes with being a follower of Jesus Christ knowing that the blood of Jesus Christ covers my sins. Maybe you weren't here last week and you're like, man, I'm glad I'm here today because I want to do that but if you need to just come before God and symbolically let some things go as the band leads you in this song, come. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, give us the courage not just the courage to stand up or step out in the aisle or walk forward or write something down, but the courage to turn away from those suitcases and to walk away. See, I, I can't speak for other people, but the thing I need the courage for the most in a moment like this is letting go. Because if, if, the other, if people in this room are like me at all, uh, there, there are hurts and bitterness and, and some things, emotions that I don't want to let go of because I don't want to forgive or I don't want to get over that. I want to feel sorry for myself or I, I don't want to move on or I, I just don't know how to move on or uh, I'm scared. I'm scared to let go. I pray you would give us the courage to let go, to walk away from that addiction or that sin or that emotional baggage or that unforgiveness and begin to journey a new life in Jesus. Would you give us the courage to let go in Jesus' name? Amen.